So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we, are, we are going to have uh, the first session with uh, Professor Alatas. He's going to be introduced by, by Tiago, who's one of our researchers. But as I'm very pleased as uh, Emeritus, now Emeritus Director of SES, I'm very glad to just uh, welcome him. Uh, Professor Alatas, I'm not going to mention anything you know already about Professor Alatas because he's in some of our courses we have been using his, uh, his work um, and we are very pleased that he comes to the very high profile college of global studies that we are launching now and uh, so today we, we are going to have this lecture and tomorrow there will be uh, two sessions on religion and other issues that will be they take place in our uh, in our headquarters in Sofia. So welcome Farid. Great pleasure to have you, and then uh, Jan will take a seat and then Jan will take over. I will also stand for the moment and uh, just introduce uh, Professor Alatas. And uh, first of all, uh, welcome, welcome you, and welcome you very warmly to, to SESH. Uh, thank you for accepting our invitation. It's really a great pleasure and a, and a honor to have you here with us. Um, just a few words before I introduce you, just a few words on the, on the objectives of the College of Global Studies. So, we are, uh, my colleague Miguel Bandera Geronimo, now Paula Muniz and, and, and me, we are organizing this, this year is the first edition of this initiative, uh, with the objective of creating a forum for uh, critically um, discussing uh, issues concerning global dynamics with a particular focus on the global south, on relations global north, uh, global south and also global south and global south. But be, be, besides that there is also another specificity to our um, uh, College of Global Studies is that we privilege uh, epistemologies which are in a way uh, critical of the hegemonic Eurocentric epistemology. So we welcome um, uh, non-Eurocentric epistemologies and that's why we are very interested in um, hearing you. We already know your, your work and we are very much looking forward to your um, to your speech and uh, have the opportunity to debate with you uh, your ideas. I would like now to, to introduce uh, Professor Alatas, um, distinguished professor of sociology at the National University of Singapore. Uh, professor Alatas headed the Department of Malay Studies uh, at the National University of Singapore from, from 2007 to 2013. He lectured at University of Malaya in the Department of Southeast Asian Studies prior to joining this uh, university. Um, it is worthwhile um, noting that in the early 90s uh, he was a research associate at Women and Human Resource Studies Unit, University Saints Malaysia, and um, author of a vast uh, published work, many journal, journal articles that I won't quote, but I'd like to highlight a few recent published books. And these include Ibn Haldum, uh, published in 2013 uh, by the, the Oxford University Press, applying Ibn Haldum, the recovery of a lost tradition in sociology by Routledge, published in 2014, and with uh, Vinita Sinha, Sociological Theory Beyond the Canon, published in Paul Grave in 2017. I think these are, for now, I don't know, Professor, if you'd like to uh, mention another uh, book or maybe something you have in print, uh, we can later on discuss about this. So. Uh, the floor is yours, Professor Lattes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, <coughs> I would like to thank uh, all of you. Thank the Center for Social Studies for the kind invitation uh, to bring me all the way from, uh, from Singapore. Um, actually, I came, I flew from Kuala Lumpur, which is my home, 
um, Kuala Lumpur is just a um, 40 minute flight uh, from Singapore. So I, I work in Singapore but go back and forth um, to my home in Kuala Lumpur. And um, uh, I like living in, in Singapore and in Kuala Lumpur. The only problem is we are too far from everywhere else in the world. You know, we, and That's why the, the Europeans uh, refer to us as the Far East. Yeah. Of course, for us, it's not far. <laughs> you know? yeah. This is part of the problem of, uh, of Eurocentrism. We, we don't even have terminology to uh, refer to ourselves. Um, so in, in my part of the world, we, we, we refer to ourselves as being in Asia. But Asia is uh, an Orientalist uh, term. Um, and all the terminology is used to refer to our geography, East Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, West Asia, are all Orientalist uh, terms. And you know, you, you wonder how we refer to ourselves in the past, before there was colonialism, before there was contact with, uh, with the West. And we can ask the same question for um, almost uh, all concepts in the, uh, in the social sciences. Um, Maybe, you know, let me just begin with, uh, with an example. Um, you are familiar with uh, the series of wars that took place um, between the 11th and the 13th centuries, um, between um, uh, Europe and, uh, um, and a part of the Muslim world. What do you call those wars? Crusades, yes? Yeah. Um, now the interesting thing is, even in the, the Muslim world, uh, as well as everywhere else in the world, they are referred to as crusades, or in the language of these various uh, communities, translation of the word crusades. So the Arabs refer to uh, the, the, these wars as Harb um, al-Salibi, uh, which means crusades, because Salib means the cross. Uh, the Persians call it the uh, Jangir Salibi, same, uh, same translation, the, the war of the, uh, of the cross. Um, and in Malay language, we call it Prang Salib, which also means <coughs> the war of the, the cross. So in all these languages, they are referred to um, as uh, crusades. Now, here you have the problem. When you refer to these wars as crusades, the implication is that they are they were a series of wars of Christianity against Islam. Now, this may have been true for a section of Europeans, for example, the church, and others who were involved in the war. Uh, it, it may have been seen as a war of Christianity against Islam. But from the point of view of Muslims, it was not seen as a, as a religious war. The, the Muslims, during the time of the so-called Crusades, never, never referred to those wars as Crusades, and they did not even refer to the, uh, uh, the the European soldiers as Crusaders or as Christians. They referred to them as Franks. Mm -hmm. In Arabic, uh, Faranj or Ifranj, of um, uh, Farangi. There was no religious connotation attached to the wars in the minds of the Arabs. Well, they were not just Arabs. They, in fact, one, in one of the crusades, you have uh, the famous uh, Salahuddin Ayyubi, mm -hmm. uh, who was Kurdish. Yeah? Um, so among the Muslims, you had Arabs, you had uh, Kurds, but you also had non-Muslims. You had Jews and Arab Christians, Arab Jews and Arab Christians. And it was very clear to the, the Muslims that the Europeans, when they came on their way to the Holy Land to fight, they killed Eastern Christians. So in the minds of the Muslims, this was not a Christian-Muslim war. It was a war of Europeans, Faranj, Franks, against uh, Muslims, but not, not exclusively Muslims, because there were also Jews and Arabs who were living in Palestine, whose lands were also appropriated uh, by, the, uh, by the Crusaders. <coughs> but over time, because of the domination of a Eurocentric way of thinking, the Muslims themselves have taken on this terminology, and they have forgotten the way that they used in the past to look at those uh, crusades. Now, if you can imagine that 
that almost the, the, the entirety of the social sciences are based on this kind of terminological imposition, such that we have um, forgotten other ways of looking at the, at the world. So I think for me this is the central problem of uh, the Eurocentricity of, uh, of knowledge. Um, I, uh, no, rather, rather than, um, than give you um, a very systematic introduction to how I see the problem of Eurocentrism, I, I feel, first of all, there's not enough time for that. And also, I think you're all very familiar uh, with um, many of these, uh, these issues. Um, instead, what I would like to, to make is five points about um, the problem of Eurocentrism and the response to Eurocentrism as we see it in the Malay world. And I'm referring to the Malay world. Um, when I say Malay world, um, I'm referring to the Malay-speaking world of Southeast Asia. Now, if you look at the Muslim world in general, there are a few cultural regions in the Muslim world. Um, you have the Arab-speaking part of the Muslim world, right? about 22 countries where Arabic is the main language um, in, in which we have a long history of, uh, uh, of philosophical and cultural, religious, uh, literary uh, discourse. This, so this is the Arab world. You also have the Persianate world, the Persian-speaking world, which consists of uh, countries like Iran, of course, Afghanistan, uh, Tajikistan, uh, as well as uh, pockets of uh, communities of people speaking Persian in uh, other countries. Then you have the very vast Turkic speaking world, in which uh, they speak Turkish or a variety of uh, uh, Turkish uh, language. So Turkey, of course, um, Afghanistan, uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, um, Kyrgyzstan, Eastern Turkestan, which is uh, um, also known as uh, Xinjiang, which is part of uh, Chinese, China, which is very much in the news uh, nowadays because the Chinese government has taken a very uh, radical stance against the practice of, uh, of Islam. For example, it, it became prohibited to fast. Now is the month of Ramadan, and it is prohibited to fast in, uh, in Xinjiang. Um, so you have the Turkic-speaking world. Uh, and then you have India. Uh, which um, um, has influences from the Turkic speaking world and the Persianate uh, world, but basically it has its own, uh, because of the interaction with Hindu culture, it has its own uh, cultural expression of, of Islam. And finally, you have the Malay world of Southeast Asia, united by the Malay language spoken by about um, slightly more than 200 million uh, people, um, which has been influenced by. Uh, um, many parts of the, the Muslim world, the Arabs, the Persians, the Turks, the Indians, and also the, the Chinese, but has its own distinct expression of Islam. So I'm speaking really about the, about the Malay world. I also forgot to mention China, because China has its own um, uh, cultural expression of Islam for, for centuries. Uh, Islam emerged in China as early as the, um, the, uh, the 8th century. So Islam is very old in, uh, in China. Um, but I think many people are unfamiliar with the, the discourse, the anti-Eurocentric discourse that has emerged from the, the Malay world. And I think it would be nice, um, interesting for me to, um, uh, to relate to you some of the issues um, that, are being, um, that I see as, uh, as pertinent to the problem of, of Eurocentrism. So I said five, uh, five points. <coughs> now the first point is that as far as the Malay world is concerned, the, the beginnings of uh, uh, the critique of Eurocentrism began in the 19th century. Um, so let me say a few, a few words uh, about that. Now, one uh, seminal work that emerged uh, as a critique of Eurocentrism was uh, a book by, by Said Hussein Alatas called The Myth of the Lazy Native. Right? Um, now, the this work, The Myth of the Lazy Native, which was a critique of um, colonial constructions of the native, specifically <coughs> in British Malaya, 
um, Dutch uh, East Indies, which is now Indonesia, and uh, the Philippines. Um, this work, um, which looked at the colonial construction of the native, and looked at the, the role of that construction in advancing the interests of colonial capitalism, and furthermore, looked at how the colonial construction of the lazy native was internalized by the native elite and continued to be propagated by the native elite after political independence. <coughs> this was basically the, uh, the, the work of uh, Alatas in the myth of the, of the lazy native. But Alatas' work on the myth of the lazy native was influenced and inspired by the work of Jose Rizal, the, the, the Filipino uh, thinker and activist who was writing in the latter half of the 19th century. And I think it's a very interesting example because it's an early case of the critique of, uh, of Eurocentrism. Uh, it's an early case um, because we don't have many critiques of Eurocentrism in the 19th century. Um, and Rizal was, was critical of, uh, of Eurocentrism <coughs> before the term was there. You know, before people spoke um, explicitly about Eurocentrism or about Orientalism, he was already engaging in, uh, in the critique of, uh, of a discourse that would later come to be known as Eurocentric or Orientalist uh, or discourse. Um, now, um, Rizal was well known for two novels, Noli Metangere and El, El Filibusterismo, he wrote in Spanish. Um, and these novels were actually written when he was uh, um, uh, living in, uh, in Europe. He, he was in Spain, uh, in Belgium, and in Germany, uh, where he composed these works. Um, and they were also published, uh, published in Belgium. Um, Noli Mitangere was written in 1887, El Filibusterismo Terismo in uh, 1891. And in these uh, novels, you actually have a depiction of colonial society and the problems of, of dislocation and, and, and uh, uh, exploitation in colonial society, um, especially in Noli Mitangere. And in uh, El Filibus Terismo, it examines the possibilities of revolution uh, against the colonial state uh, in, the, in the Philippines. For me, what is interesting about Rizal is that um, we can extract his sociology of colonial society from his work. Um, he wrote these novels. He also he was very prolific in terms of uh, his journalistic uh, writings on various uh, themes. Um, now, one of the well-known essays that he wrote was called The Indolence of the Filipinos. Indolence meaning uh, laziness. The Indolence of the Filipinos. In which he was critiquing uh, colonial construction of, uh, of laziness. Um, and uh, it was a systematic treatment in the, in the sense that he, it's probably the, one of the first attempt to systematically define laziness and to, un to understand how this idea of laziness is related to the conditions of colonial uh, society. Um, so he defined laziness as the lack of love or the lack of interest in work. And then he inquired as to whether it is true that the Filipinos were, were lazy. Now, in order to make that an argument that they were not lazy, he had to return to the pre-colonial past of the, of the Filipinos to, to understand what they were doing before the Spaniards came. So he looked at some historical uh, writings on the on uh, pre-colonial Filipinos, and he discovered that Filipinos were had active uh, craft industry. They were active in trade. They controlled trade trade uh, routes. They were shipbuilders. So, from all this evidence, he suggested that they were not a lazy society. So, why do you have the discourse on lazy Filipinos? Then he looked at Filipino society in his time. And he saw that indeed there, there was a reluctance to work among Filipinos. There was this loss of love for work. Now, according to the Spanish discourse, the laziness of the Filipinos, the inherent and even genetic uh, 
laziness of the Filipinos was a justification for colonial rule, as was the case with the British and the Dutch, maybe even the, the Portuguese. Um, Rizal took that argument, he, he, he reversed the argument. He said that rather than laziness being the reason for colonial rule, rather than the laziness of the natives necessitating colonial rule, it was colonial rule and the nature of colonial society that created the conditions of laziness. And in many of his writings, he documents how the life chances of Filipinos were, were reduced by the, the colonial state. For example, forced labor, uh, confiscation of property. Um, he would document, for example, how every now and again, a uh, uh, Filipino farmer would be uh, forced to work for the church and neglect his own land, or he would be forced to pay high taxes. So all these conditions led to the Filipinos feeling that it was fruitless to work hard because colonial rule was arbitrary, property could be taken, confiscated, uh, the fruits of your labor, your crop could be confiscated, you may be asked to pay higher than normal taxes and so on and so forth. So because of the arbitrary nature of colonial rule, it became pointless to work hard. You had no control over your, your product. This created a culture of the uh, lack of love for, for work. So this was his, uh, his treatment of, uh, of laziness, uh, of the discourse on laziness. And you can see that it's actually a sociological approach. It's what later, much later, came to be known as a sociology of, uh, of knowledge. Right? And this, this was the approach that influenced my Sajjus uh, and uh, Alatas um, and uh, was part of the inspiration behind his work on the, the myth of the lazy native. When I was uh, uh, reading, uh, uh, when I was uh, you know, doing research on this, uh, on this issue, I also came to realize that um, the, um, the Brazilian sociologist Gilberto Freire also wrote on a similar theme, um, uh, you know, discussing um, the um, uh, Brazilian elite construction of laziness of, uh, of, uh, of Brazilian um, uh, I think he was talking about um, uh, the, uh, what he refers to as the useless uh, sarcastically of course the useless population of uh, uh, Caboclos I'm, I'm not sure what that means. Yeah. And, and light-skinned uh, mulattoes. Yeah. Um, so in his book, Master, I think you're all more familiar than I am with these works, uh, Master and, and Slaves, uh, there's a very similar approach to the, the study of uh, the colonial construction of, uh, of uh, Brazilians. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so this was one point that I wanted to make. Um, that in the rest of the world, uh, in Latin America, in, uh, in Europe, uh, in Africa, even other parts of Asia, uh, people are not too familiar with the anti-Eurocentric discourse that comes out of the Malay world. Right? And my point is that not only is there an anti-Eurocentric discourse, anti discourse that comes out of the Malay world, but that this, that this discourse goes back to the 19th century, which is quite, uh, quite early. So Rizal um, had an influence, of course, on, a, on several generations of uh, Filipino scholars, and there's a, a lively uh, discourse, counter-Eurocentric discourse in the, in the Philippines. But Rizal also had an influence on um, Malaysians, such as uh, Cyrus and Alatas, and also on Indonesian uh, scholars. Uh, one of the, the most interesting Indonesian scholars um, is uh, um, um, Pramudia Anantatur, who was uh, a novelist. Um, and he wrote um, in the uh, 19th, uh, 20th century. Um, he passed away about 10 years ago. Uh, 
and uh, his novels are historical novels that provide histor uh, reinterpretations of Indonesian history, beginning with the pre-colonial period and moving into the colonial and late colonial periods. Um, so in a sense, similar to Rizal, um, but um, um, very much underappreciated and understudied. But he has done more in terms of reinterpreting Indonesian history away from a colonial perspective. He has done more for that uh, than the historians them, themselves. So Pramudya Nantator, his work is uh, uh, translated to, uh, to English. I'm not sure whether it is available in, uh, uh, in Portuguese, but uh, definitely in, in, uh, in English. Now, um, on this first point about the beginnings of um, uh, NG Eurocentric scholarship in uh, the Malay world, as I was uh, thinking about this this uh, this point and thinking about talking to you here in uh, in Coimbra, um, I came across uh, some writing about um, uh, a novel in Malaysia, a Malay novel, which uh, thematizes the, you know, the issue of the circumnavigation of the earth by Ferdinand Magellan, um, which um, is a story that has very much to do with the Malay world. Um, now, this novel, uh, published in 1957, concerns this story of the, the circumnavigation of the Earth. It was uh, uh, published in 1957. It, it, um, it looks at, um, you see, the story of the circumnavigation of the Earth is also related to colonialism. Because obviously it was um, a consequence the rounding of the globe, that trip that Ferdinand Magellan took, was um, was a consequence of looking for what they call the Spice Islands, right? You know the Spice Islands. The, the, they refer to primarily the, the the Moluccas Islands as the Spice Islands. The, the Moluccas Islands is located in what is today called Indonesia, and you have um, I think the primary spice is. Uh, um, what do you call that thing? Um, cloves. You know cloves? Cloves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and of course, many other uh, spices, uh, coriander, uh, cumin, and, and pepper, and other spices. Um, so, um, Magellan was very interested in finding these uh, spice islands. Um, now, in, in terms of the, the history of the facts, what actually happened was, um, uh, and you'll see the relationship with the Malay world and the issue of uh, reinterpretation of, of history. Um, in 1511, um, you had the conquest of Malacca mm -hmm. by, by uh, al Bakr, the conquest of Malacca. Um, Magellan was there. Um, and uh, during this, uh, the, 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 the skirmishes, during the fighting, uh, there was a Malay. Um, who was captured as a, as a slave by the Portuguese. Um, and according to Portuguese records and other European records, this, this Malay um, was quite <coughs> impressive. He impressed Magellan. Magellan bought him. Uh, and I, according to some accounts, he was bought in Malacca and other accounts in Goa, and then bought to, brought to Portugal. He was given the name of uh, Enrique. Is that correct, Enrique? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was given the name. So we don't know his Malay name. So from the very beginning, he's given uh, his identity is taken away from him. He's given uh, you mm -hmm. know, a European name, and we don't know what uh, his religion was. Um, it's not stated that he converted to Christianity, but uh, his name was Enriquez. He was brought brought to uh, Portugal, uh, and then you know, um, after Magellan had unsuccessfully um, was not able to uh, persuade the uh, Portuguese uh, rulers to fund his expedition back to uh, the Malay world. Um, he was able to 
get the support of the Spaniards. And he made the trip back to, um, to the Malay world, westward, yes, across the Atlantic, um, south of uh, Latin America, and then across the Pacific uh, to what was not yet called the Philippine Islands. Um, and um, in the Philippine Islands, in one of the islands, I think in a place called Cebu, um, Magellan was killed. Magellan was killed. Enrique uh, was with him all along during the expedition. Um, now the theory is that if Enrique eventually returned to his home in Malacca, he would have been the first one to have circumnavigated the, the not Magellan, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, but this is of course speculation because we're not sure whether Enrique actually made it back to, uh, to Malacca. Um, but the issue of the, uh, this ambiguity um, and the dominance of the story that Magellan was the first to circumnavigate the, the globe led a Malay writer uh, by the name of uh, Harun Aminur Rashid, I will just call him Harun, led him to write an historical novel in which he would reinterpret the history of the circumnavigation of the globe by providing, giving prominence to Enrique. Not only giving prominence to Enrique, but giving a name to Enrique and giving, giving an identity to, uh, to Enrique. Um, so, uh, what, uh, what Harun does is, first of all, he calls, uh, he calls Enrique um, Awang. A-W-A-N-G. Awang is a Malay, a Malay word. He calls him Panglima Awang. Panglima in Malay means commander. In other words, he's not merely a slave, but he is, uh, he is a commander. Uh, now, of course, you know, we're talking about the, 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 the uh, interstitials of, of, you know, history and fiction, right? But in this fiction, you know, the way I read it is that it's, it's a decolonial, uh, it's a, a decolonial um, attempt um, of, it's a, a decolonial account of an historical event, not just any historical event, but an historical event, the circumnavigation of the, of the globe, um, that was an integral part of the history of colonialism. Because the, this whole expedition in which the globe was uh, circumnavigated resulted in the colonization of, uh, of the Philippines. It resulted in the colonization of the Philippines, it, and itself was a result of the colonization of uh, uh, of Malacca, of the conquest of, uh, of Malacca. Um, so the maritime search and exploration um, of the Spice Islands um, and the discovery and colonization of a part of the Malay world that later on came to be known as the, the Philippines, because it was only the the, the voyage around the world uh, took place between 1519 and 1521. Um, the Philippines was named the Philippines in 1543 um, after the, the ruler of uh, the king of the, uh, uh, the Philippines. Um, so uh, this is how you know we, we can approach this uh, this novel. And uh, I think what is uh, what is interesting is that. Um, um, the, the novel gives, um, it's decolonial in a, in a number of ways. It puts non-Europeans in the foreground, right? Um, it gives subjectivity to the actors, to the non-European actors. So Enrique, who has no identity, is given a, a, you know, a, a European name, a Portuguese name, uh, now is given a Malay name. Uh, but it's, it's not just that he's given uh, a Malay name, he also has a role. He's not just a slave. He, he starts out as a slave, but later on through, during the voyage he becomes an assistant to Magellan. Uh, and later on, after Magellan is, uh, is, is killed, he becomes a commander uh, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the ship. 
It plays a very important role in translation. Uh, and that role of translation is also there in the historical records. Uh, at some point, um, one of the accounts of the Magellan expedition was by <coughs> Pigafetta, the Italian um, writer. Uh, and uh, Pigafetta was also on the, on the voyage. Right? And uh, Pigafetta makes some reference to Enriquez. But the, the references to Enriquez are extremely sparse. Very few references to Enriquez, to Enrique in, uh, in, these, uh, in these historical <coughs> accounts. So the gaps are filled in by Harun in the novel uh, Panglima uh, Awam. Now the interesting thing also is that this novel is not only decolonial, but in a, in a way it takes a subaltern perspective. Because it begins, the novel begins with the conquest of Malacca by the Portuguese. It talks about how um, the Portuguese um, uh, enter Malacca uh, and the, the king, the Sultan of Malacca, has gone, they run away, and Malacca is left to the common people, including Awam, to defend uh, the empire from the, the Portuguese. And eventually, um, uh, Malacca is lost to the Portuguese. Awang is sold as a slave. His name is changed to Enrique, um, and he's, uh, he travels to, to Europe, and then accompanies Magellan back on the trip. But during the trip, he plays a central role. He plays an important role in terms of translation, in terms of his knowledge of the seas, his knowledge of uh, the various locations, the Spice Islands, the Philippine Islands, um, which enable, according to the novel, which enable Magellan to navigate, right? Because there were certain latitudes, uh, or rather longitudes, um, near, near the equator, uh, which were not known uh, by the Portuguese and Portuguese maps. Um, so they could only have been known if there were locals who, who could uh, provide that information. So uh, Awan played an important role in terms of, um, in all these uh, senses. Um, and Awan was therefore um, given an identity and a role. He sees being merely an object. Um, because in the European accounts of the uh, Magellan's uh, expedition, Awan was Enriquez without, without an identity and merely an object. Whereas he becomes a subject in, uh, in the novel by, uh, by Harun. Um, the interesting thing also in the novel is that Awan resists being seduced by the white man. And when I read about that, uh, it reminded me of Fanon's um, discussion on how the, you know, Fanon has this no, uh, concept of lactification. You know what I mean by lactification? Lactification from milk, right? To, to become white. So one of the obsessions of the black man is to become white, um, to, to be lactified. Um, and uh, one way of doing that, uh, short of actually changing your skin color, was to marry uh, a white woman. Um, and this was, this was the dream of uh, you know, every black man, Fanon says. Um, now, in, uh, in Panglima Awang, in the novel, um, when uh, Enrique, Enrique uh, is taken to Portugal, he meets the, the sister of uh, Magellan. Uh, she's given the name uh, Miriam, or Mariam. Um, and she falls in love with him. Uh, but she is, he is not interested in her because he remembers his, his old love in, uh, in Malacca. Um, so he resists this, uh, this uh, seduction. So you find many decolonial themes in the, in the novel, which I think are quite interesting. But when the novel was read in, uh, in the 1950s, it was not read in a, in a decolonial way. It is only now beginning to, become, beginning to be read in a decolonial way. That itself, I think, is, uh, is quite interesting and quite, uh, quite telling. So, um, so this was my first point um, uh, about uh, the beginnings of anti-Eurocentric discourse in the Malay world uh, that we can <coughs> trace to the 19th uh, century. What time did we begin? 4 10, I think. Yeah. And I have about one hour, is that right? That 45 minutes. 45 minutes. Okay, all right. I, I better hurry up then. Um, now, I'd like to, uh, 
to, to make a few other points in the back time to make uh, uh, four other points. Now the second point is that in uh, Eurocentric, um, anti-Eurocentric discourse, um, there are a few enemies Enemies from within as well as enemies from outside. Um, I would like to refer to three kinds of enemies. Nativists, imposters, and silencers. Nativists, imposters, and silencers. And I'm going to go through them very, very quickly. Now the nativists basically are those who reverse Eurocentrism and are equally ethnocentric as the Eurocentric uh, Eurocentrism that they they critique. Um, so, if, uh, if if we say that uh, Euro Eurocentric knowledge or European knowledge is not universal, <coughs> which I think is a fair claim to make, uh, but they make the claim that um, it is only local knowledge that uh, is relevant to the study of our own society. So, for example, uh, to, to study Islamic society, you can only use concepts that come from the Islamic tradition. To study Indian societies can only use concepts that come from the Indian tradition. Concepts and theories that come from other traditions are, uh, by default, uh, irrelevant. Uh, so there's uh, a near total rejection of, uh, of Western-oriented, uh, uh, Western-originated knowledge. Um, so these are the nativists, which um, you might call reverse Eurocentrists or reverse uh, Orientalists, or you might even call them Occidentalists, because involved Related also is their caricature and stereotype of the of the Occident. So this is a problem that we frequently encounter in trying to advance a counter Eurocentric discourse. You know, in other words, we are caught you know between Eurocentric discourse on the one hand and the nativist discourse on the on the other hand. <coughs> now, I, I myself have sometimes been been misunderstood as somebody who promotes. Um, uh, a kind of discourse that is nativist. Because I speak about Islamic tradition, then I'm associated with people who say that for the study of Islamic society, Western social science is irrelevant. Because there are Muslims who make that claim. Uh, and when I speak about Ibn Khaldun, I'm sometimes associated with people who take that nativist uh, position. So it's something that we constantly need to guard against and to, and to clarify. So nativism is one problem. Now the other problem, which, which is I think uh, uh, a more serious problem, the imposters. Um, what I mean by the imposters, those discourses which uh, present themselves as anti-Eurocentric, but which in reality function to strengthen Eurocentrism. For me, uh, a great example is from the field of Islamic economics. Now, Islamic economics presents itself as a, an alternative to capitalism and socialism. <coughs> and, and at, at a practical level, they have created um, not only theory, but also in practice, an Islamic banking system, an Islamic banking and financial system. And this Islamic banking and financial system is actually in operation. It is an operation in many parts of the world. Um, many uh, Western banks, for example, uh, the British bank, the British-based bank, uh, uh, Standard, the Standard Chartered Bank, which uh, operates in Britain, in Hong Kong, in Singapore, and other places, uh, has Islamic counters. So not only are there Islamic banks based on Islamic economic theory, but there are also Western conventional banks that have Islamic counters in which you can trade in various um, instruments um, which are compliant with Sharia law, with Islamic law. For example, there's no interest in these, uh, in these instruments. Um, now, in theory, it sounds anti-Eurocentric, it sounds anti-capitalist. In practice, it is not. Because the Islamic banking and financial sector can only exist in the context of capitalism. They're actually part and parcel of uh, global capitalism. 
they, do, they, they are not, uh, you know, what uh, you, you would call uh, liberated zones that exist independently of capitalism or parallel to capitalism. They are part and parcel of capitalism. Furthermore, Islamic economics, if you examine it carefully, is really nothing but neoclassical economics dressed up in Islamic terminology. The assumptions, the theory, the concepts, are all derived from neoclassical economics. Um, and the critique of capitalism that you find in Marxist economic theory, for example, or Marxist uh, social theory, uh, uh, relating to the labor theory of value, relating to uh, the political alienation, and, and so on, are not tackled by Islamic economics. There is no critique of capitalism. So they end up being apologists for capitalism. So in, in the way I think, Islamic economics is actually bourgeois economics and serves to advance the interest of, in today's case, uh, neoliberal uh, capitalism. So I think the identification, the definition and the identification of imposters is important in the work that we do to counter uh, Eurocentric discourse. Um, now the, the third problem, uh, the third enemy are the silences, right? And I've, uh, I've divided divided the silences into two categories, the excluders and the marginalizers. Uh, now the excluders are those who simply exclude reference. Uh, and I'm not going to go into too much detail uh, about that. I can refer you to some, to some writing about it uh, later. But um, I remember, just to give you a very simple example, in my university, in the National University of Singapore, um, a, a colleague in the Department of uh, Southeast Asian Studies spoke about the history of anti-Eurocentric discourse in our university, but not once mentioned the role of Malay studies. Malay studies, which was founded in 1967 by Said Hussein Alatas, who wrote The Myth of the Lazy Native, who wrote a number of works uh, against uh, colonial discourse and colonial categories, um, who had students who came after him, um, by now, there's a third generation of scholars who follow his work. So Malay studies has a tradition um, of counter-Eurocentric discourse uh, in Singapore and in Southeast Asia in general. But this was not mentioned, uh, not even mentioned. Um, so I find that in our region, um, and this may be also a, a syndrome of, um, uh, of Eurocentrism, that scholars of my generation and younger scholars who speak about Eurocentrism forget about the critique that was done <coughs> in their own community, in their own academic uh, or scholarly community. But they refer to Edward Said. They refer to uh, Walter Mignolo. They refer to Beatrice Spivak. They refer to all the scholars who are in the Western centers of learning. And I know, you know, to me, one should make these references, but not at the expense of people in your own tradition who have come before you and who have uh, participated uh, in a very important way in this, uh, in this critique. So we have that problem as, as one example of silences. Now, the other example of silences are the, the Western scholars who marginalize our discourse. And I'd like to give one example, which is a, a favorite example of mine. Uh, uh, Piotr Stomka. I don't know if you're familiar with Piotr Stomka, um, I was on the, I know him because I was on the council of the International Sociological Association for, for eight years. And for four of those years, he was uh, president of the the International Sociological Association. Um, but um, uh, Stomka, in, in uh, referring to these efforts, during those days when he was president, the, 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 the composition of the, uh, of the council um, became more diverse. There were more people from the South. That, that process of getting more people from the, from the global South into the council of the International Sociological Association uh, was actually started, uh, I think, by Wallerstein in the 90s. 
but it took many years. And by, by the 2000s, uh, we found more people from the South, and I was one of them. My colleague, Benita Sinha, was also another. Uh, people from South Africa, uh, from the Arab world. Now the president is uh, Sari Hanafi from, uh, from Lebanon. Um, so there was more uh, uh, participation of people from the South in the council. Um, it was also a time in the late 90s and early 2000s when more and more of us were writing about the problem of Eurocentrism. Um, now, Stonka had a reaction to this, but his reaction is very interesting. Um, he referred to writings that suggested alternative concepts, concepts alternative to Western concepts. So, for example, uh, he made reference to Chinese concepts of self. <coughs> reciprocity, change, shame, network, Chinese concepts. But Shonka's point was very interesting. He said that these Chinese concepts are merely words. They are merely translations of Western concepts. You, you see what I'm saying? Um, certain scholars um, from China, from Korea, from Taiwan, would name Korean and Chinese concepts that could be roughly translated to those terms I mentioned, self, reciprocity, shame, and so on and so forth. Um, now, Stonka's position was that these are merely Chinese translations of uh, Western concepts. This is a very good problem, because he refused to see that embedded in the Chinese term is a Chinese concept. Why is it not possible to see the Western terms as Western translations of Chinese concepts? Why is a Chinese term or a Korean term or a Malay term merely a translation of the Western term? Why is it not possible that a Chinese term for self is not only a Chinese term, but also embedded in that term is a notion of self that is different from a Western notion of self, a notion of self that you find in uh, you know, in, in the mainstream social psychology, for example. Um, <clears throat> you get what I'm saying? The failure here is to see language as a repository of concepts. And language, non-European languages, merely become tools to translate from English and French or German into that language. They merely become tools of translation. There is no subjectivity in these languages. There's no, these, these languages are not seen as containing the words. <coughs> they are not seen as containing words that point towards different concepts. So, it would be like, uh, you are familiar with Ibn Khaldun, and Ibn Khaldun's concept of asabiyah, um, which roughly means solidarity. But if you read into Ibn Khaldun, Durkheim's notion of solidarity, then you are merely using Ibn Khaldun's Arabic term as a translation for Durkheim's notion of solidarity. You are not seeing an original conception of solidarity in the term Asabiya. So this is the problem with, uh, with uh, Stonka. And that leads me to, uh, to my, next, my, my third point, that language, and I think this is where the, uh, the development of counter Eurocentric discourse um, has to, uh, this is what the counter Eurocentric discourse has to take seriously, has to take more seriously. And this is probably um, uh, a, a new front um, at which um, the uh, development of counter Eurocentric discourse can take place. Taking language seriously, taking the non European languages as repositories of uh, concepts and, uh, and ideas. Um, you know, in, uh, in the Malay world, when people study migration, of course, like everywhere else, we, we translate texts from English, usually, usually American texts, into English, into Malay language. Um, and the Malay words that we use to translate <coughs> migration lose their original significance. Um, there's one word in Malay, rantau, R-A-N-T-A-U, rantau. Merantau means to, to move. 
Now that word is often translated as uh, migration. But in the Malay language, the word merantau refers to a specific sense of migration. So for example, if I migrate from uh, Kuala Lumpur to Lisbon, it's not called merantau. Because merantau refers to migration within a cultural region. So let's put it this way. Uh, if, uh, if you um, migrate um, within the Caribbean, although you are migrating to different nation states, but it's within the same cultural region, the Malays would not call that migration, they would call that maranta. For migration from one cultural area to another, they would use another term. So if you examine these different terms, what you have are different conceptualizations of migration. But when you ignore those conceptualizations, you merely use the term to translate um, a, a, you know, uh, an, an English uh, term, then that meaning is, uh, is lost. So this is what I mean by taking language uh, seriously. Now this leads me to my fourth point. <clears throat> in translation, in translation, there is also, unfortunately, an accomplishment of Orientalism. And this is what we have to you know, be careful about. Um, and this orientality of translation emerges because of the domination of European categories and, and concepts. Um, again, you know, taking an example from the from the Malay world. When we study um, pre-colonial economy and society, let's say Malacca. I'm actually working on a, uh, a project on uh, Malacca economy and society. Um, how do we characterize pre-colonial economy and society? What are the concepts that we have? Uh, we have the Asiatic mode of production. We have um, various uh, theories of uh, feudalism and so on and so forth. Now these are all not necessarily irrelevant. But what I notice about these conceptualizations is that they are all based on the basic division between town and country. Because these theories come from European discourse and European experience. Uh, and they are based on the basic division between town and country. Which does not apply to Malacca. Because in the Malay world, and in many parts of uh, the, the tropical world, the basic division is not between town and country, not between rural and urban. It's usually between land and water. Right? Um, for example, on land itself, we make a distinction between upriver and downriver. Because the river is the basic source of livelihood. So you have water there. But not only the river, the sea itself. Because people live on the sea. They don't only live off the sea, but they live on the sea. Just as in North Africa, in Ibn Khaldun's time, people lived in cities, but they also lived in the desert. Right? In the desert, they were nomadic people. They moved around. Now, in Malacca, people lived on land, but they also lived on the sea. They are called the Orang Lao, the sea people. They lived on the sea, they lived on boats on the sea, they were sea nomads, you could call them. They moved around. And just as in Ibn Khaldun's time, the desert nomads provided military support to the, the urban-based rulers, sultans. In Malacca, the sea nomads provided the military support to the, 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 the sultan of Malacca, who's based on land. So the political economy of Malacca consists of both land and sea. It's impossible to ignore the sea, because the sea is, is, is uh, in an integral part of the political economy of, of Malacca. So the basic distinction, town and country, doesn't apply. Right? The basic distinction is land and, and water. That's an example of, you know, uh, now, just to, 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 yeah, to give you another example of the orientality of, of translation, back to Ibn Khaldun, but this is one of my, my areas of, of interest. Um, the basic distinction in Ibn Khaldun is between Hadari and Badawi society. Badawi 
which is the origin of the English term Bedouin, right? And Hadari, which means um, settled society. Settled society versus nomadic society. Now, many Europeans translate Hadari and Badawi as um, urban and rural, town and country. Because again, they are thinking of Ibn Khaldun's terminology through European lens, through European experience. Because you know the whole story of you know better than me, the whole story of the rise of uh, capitalism has to do with the conflict between town and country. This is a basic distinction in, in European history. So they read that into Ibn Khaldun and they translate Hadari and Badawi as rural and urban. Um, when in fact, what Ibn Khaldun meant by Hadari, settled, includes both rural and urban. So rural and urban is one, and the other is nomadic. Right? Now, the translation of Hadari and Badawi into English languages, uh, into European languages, uh, involves orientalizing Ibn Khaldun, basically. That's what I mean by the orientality of uh, translation. So this is, you know, we, we, we face enormous uh, tasks in this whole project of decolonizing uh, knowledge because we are not simply presented with our tradition uh, untouched, as it were. If we are reading, uh, even if we are reading in Arabic, because I know Arab scholars who read in Arabic and read Ibn Khaldun in Arabic, but are interpreting Ibn Khaldun in an Orientalist way. They may not be thinking in English or in French, but they look at Hazari and Badawi as rural versus uh, urban. So, orientality of translation is, is a major you know, problem for us. Um, I would just like to, you know, to end um, by saying that we recognize, as, as you do, <coughs> that it is not only knowledge which is Eurocentric. The Eurocentricity is not only of knowledge, it is also of the world in which we live. Because not only is knowledge production centered around Euro-America, but the actual way in which we live our lives, economically, politically, culturally, is also centered around Euro-America, right? The, um, the, um, the political economy of the world, uh, the, the interstate uh, system, um, the flow of, uh, and traveling of culture are all very much dominated by um, more, more America than Europe, actually. Um, and therefore, the critique of Eurocentric knowledge is not specifically or not exclusively for the purpose um, of, of generating new ideas and new knowledge for its own sake, although I think that is an important part. Um, there is an aesthetic dimension to it. Uh, there is an intrinsic pleasure in uncovering new ideas and new concepts. There's, a, there's an intrinsic uh, pleasure and worth in discovering Ibn Khaldun and developing a Khaldunian sociology um, for the interpretation of, uh, uh, of um, you know, the Mughal, the Mongol conquest of China, for example. Uh, which may not have anything to do with uh, our political economy today. There is an intrinsic uh, value in doing that. But apart from that, the, the goal of, um, uh, of recovering non-Eurocentric knowledge is also to discover different ways that we can live our lives in the, in the world today. Right? Um, because we <coughs> have come to a, a point where we find it impossible to imagine a way of living that's neither capitalist nor socialist. Uh, and I think this is our challenge. Yet there are examples out there. Of course, there are examples of individuals who live off the grid. Yes, um, in North America and Europe, there are many examples of people who leave the city, uh, um, find a place to live uh, in the countryside, away from human beings, have as little connection as possible with people. These are individuals. This is not possible to recommend for entire communities. But there are communities. Um, and I know, I know, you know, you of course know um, better than, than I do uh, about this. Um, we were talking yesterday about the Zapatistas and, um, um, and other attempts in Latin America um, to, to create alternative uh, political economies, alternative communities. Uh, and I was mentioning to you the Salvadaya movement uh, in Sri Lanka. Um, the, the, the Buddhist ecology movement in Thailand yeah, um, it's an interesting example. Um, 
which um, attempts an approach to ecology that's different from the Western approach. The Western approach um, assumes that human beings are intrinsically destructive to the ecology, and therefore human beings should have as little uh, interaction as possible. So you, for example, the solution to have parks, national parks, where human beings are not involved. You, you just preserve, right? But the Buddhist uh, ecological perspective to suggest that uh, um, going back to the past, where Buddhist, um, Buddhist monks um, and the Buddhist community regarded nature as inherently spiritual, and that therefore, far from leaving nature out of it, we should be intrinsically involved with nature, but in a way that's what we call today sustainable, respecting nature, um, not engaging in slash and burn agriculture, for example, engaging in forms of agriculture that are sustainable, that do not destroy the, the forest, um, saying prayers, offering prayers to the spirits um, as a way of educating and instilling in the minds of people the spiritual nature of, uh, of nature, of, of the forest, for example. Uh, the fact that in Sri Lanka, Buddhist monks um, controlled irrigation systems. And because of the sense of, um, the sense of uh, fairness and uh, equity, equality, they ensured that water was equally, evenly distributed throughout the community in Sri Lanka. So the, the monks, the, the temple to control uh, water, um, so we have in history, as well as the present, many examples of alternative communities, alternative political economies. And I think perhaps what I feel, what I would like to do and what many of us should do is to engage in these studies to discover these possible alternatives, uh, alter ways of living apart from socialism and capitalism, uh, to discover what the different types of these alternatives uh, are and to, and to help the movements that are involved in these alternatives uh, to, um, you know, to better articulate uh, themselves um, uh, to the rest of the, of the world. Thank you very much.